And go ahead, Tim. Good morning. I'm Tim Sheehy, president of the Metropolitan Milwaukee Association of Commerce. Our mission is to develop this region as a globally competitive location for businesses supporting high value employment to foster a vibrant quality of life for all. This program is designed to provide actionable insights into the challenges and opportunities we all face in bettering the region as a place to live, work, play, and learn. Our next webcast will be Tuesday, November 3rd from 11 to 12. The program is sponsored by, the United, by United Healthcare. In times like these, a traditional healthcare plan may not be the best fit for your business. So take a closer look at the All Savers, uh, at All Savers alternate funding of, from United Healthcare. MMAC has partnered with United Healthcare to offer coverage for groups with between five and 99 employees. Now small businesses can take advantage of the benefits typically reserved for larger companies, including underwriting for more competitive pricing, better data so your business understands where your premium dollars are going, and a potential surplus refund if claims are lower than expected. So contact your MMAC broker or visit uhc.com backslash MMAC to learn more. And a thank you to Spaces, which is serving as our temporary home during our office relocation. Over 3,000 global locations and 10 in Wisconsin, Spaces makes it easy to have a productive day at work. And a final program note, join us for a presentation with nationally renowned economist, Brian Ballou, on October 28th. His insights will help your business prosper during uncertainty. Now for today's program. Over the next four webcasts, we're gonna unpack the challenges and explore the opportunities facing the region as we recover from the pandemic. What changes can we expect to stick with us? What innovations will become the new normal? And how can we better compete for capital investment and jobs? We're gonna focus on four aspects of the region's quality of life. How will our built infrastructure develop with COVID, from COVID's impact? How will the work environment change both in and outside the office? How will our entertainment options be, be impacted? And how will they affect the way we learn? So in short, what will happen to our live, work, play, and learn value proposition as a region. Today's program will focus on how some of our key learning institutions and how they've been impacted and what lies ahead. We're grateful that UWM Chancellor Mark Money, Marquette University President Mike Lovell, and METC President Vicki Martin have joined us to share their insights. So let's get started with an update from another learning leader, Dr. John Raymond, President of the Medical College of Wisconsin, who will again provide us with an update on the healthcare impact and status of COVID. After Dr. Raymond's update, we'll take a few questions and then we'll get to our distinguished panel. Dr. Raymond, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Tim, and good morning and hello everyone. I hope that you're all well. It's an honor to be here today on this webinar with Drs. Moni, Lovell, and Martin, Mark, Mike, and Vicki, each of you is an outstanding colleague and leader, and we're fortunate to have you in the region. If I could go to the first slide, please. Um, as many of you know, Wisconsin is an epicenter of COVID-19 in the U.S. and has been for over, over two weeks. And according to the New York Times COVID-19 Metro Tracker, as of yesterday, we still had five of the top nine and eight of the top 20 metro areas in terms of new cases per 100,000 population over the last two weeks. And those are Oshkosh, Nina, Appleton, Sheboygan, Wausau West and Green Bay, Fond du Lac, Manitowoc, and Beaver Dam. Platteville and Marinette have fallen out of the top 20. So we still have eight of the 20 worst metro areas in terms of burden of COVID-19 disease. And looking forward, only one Wisconsin metro area, Sheboygan, is rated as having the fastest rises in COVID-19 cases. Although nearby, Marquette, Michigan is also on the list. So let's go to the next slide, please, and start with a summary of testing data. Cumulatively, we have tested 1.9 million people in Wisconsin as of yesterday, with just over 300,000 of those being tested in Milwaukee. 
So we've had 174,000 positive tests in Wisconsin, sorry, positive cases in Wisconsin and 35,000 in Milwaukee. And we've been increasing by about 3,000 cases per day in Wisconsin over the last week. Now the number of people tested who were reported over the last three days in Wisconsin averaged about 14,000 per day. Now I do wanna draw a distinction about tests administered and people to whom tests have been administered. We usually have about twice as many tests reported as people tested. So on average, it appears that many people are being tested more than once. And this occurs for a variety of reasons, such as frequent testing in congregate living situations, schools and frontline healthcare settings. And some people also are tested multiple times because of severe symptoms or to confirm resolution of viral shedding. Now reporting of cases rather than tests is the most appropriate public health metric. However, DHS now reports both as well as positivity rates using cases or tests reported. Our testing capacity has remained stable at about 42,000 with 117 laboratories now testing. If I could shift to the right side of the slide, daily positive tests have been trending unfavorably in Wisconsin over the last month. And yesterday there was a new high of 3,777 new cases reported in Wisconsin and 493 in Milwaukee. That was the second highest day in Milwaukee. DHS did warn us though that there's a backlog of cases yet to be counted. So we should expect continuing high daily case counts for the next few days. And just to put this in perspective, we've exceeded 2000 new COVID-19 cases 28 times and 3000 seven times over the last 26 days since we first exceeded 2,000 on September 16th. Now we're averaging 3,000, almost 3,100 cases per day now. That's four times what we were seeing in early September in terms of daily cases. Now our average case positivity rate over the last seven days in Wisconsin and Milwaukee were 21.1 and 8.1% respectively. Now these are too high and suggests that there remains a significant burden of undiagnosed COVID-19 cases, both in the state and in the Milwaukee area. Now I do note that the Milwaukee positivity rate is trending favorably, and this is most likely due to a significant increase in testing here in Southeastern Wisconsin over the last two weeks. And I would point out that we have opened a new high capacity testing site at Miller Park, and this is a step in the right direction. Next slide, please. This next slide shows various indicators of hospitalizations. Now we've had 9,319 admissions with COVID-19 to Wisconsin hospitals since the beginning of the pandemic. And as of yesterday, we had a new high of 1,172 patients in Wisconsin hospitals who have COVID-19. This is a week over week increase of 2,000, I'm sorry, 222 patients. There's also a similar trend with COVID-19 ICU admissions. Wisconsin reached a new high census of 302 yesterday with a week over week increase of 62. ICU bed availability dropped significantly in early October, but has been stable over the weekend. So there were 231 beds available yesterday, which compares to counts of close to 400 every day in August. Now our ventilator capacity is copious and this should not be a limiting factor for caring for COVID-19 and other patients as we look forward. PPE supplies also have improved, but the supply chain remains fragile and we can't take it for granted. Next slide, please. This just dives down a little bit more deeply in the data about where in the state we're experiencing increases in hospitalizations. And to start with, hospitalizations are rising in all seven of the Healthcare Emergency Readiness Coalition regions. And COVID-19 hospitalizations are at or near all-time highs for all of the HERC regions. And you can see the numbers of hospitalizations listed on the slide there. COVID-19 ICU admissions are rising or peaking in five of the seven Healthcare Emergency Readiness Coalition regions. And COVID-19 ICU admissions or at or near all-time highs for
for those regions as well. Fox Valley, Northeast, Northwest, South Central, and Western. And ICU censuses are high in six healthcare readiness coalition regions. And you can see they range from 79 to 93%. And ideally you want your ICUs to be running anywhere between 65 and 70% occupancy. The efficiency degrades significantly as those percentages go up. Now, I do wanna clarify that most of the patients in the ICUs do not have COVID-19, but a surge of COVID-19 patients requiring intensive care places a strain on our ability to take care of all of our patients. Indeed, the Madison area health systems are considering reductions in non-emergent care. This morning, there was a segment on CBS this morning about UW Health's flagship hospital in Madison being full and how that's impacting care there. Now, in terms of the Southeastern Herc, which includes Milwaukee, we currently are experiencing a boomerang or a resurgence of virus returning from the rural areas of the state into our region. And this started about a week ago. COVID-19 hospitalizations are rising and are now at an all-time high in our region, and ICU admissions are also rising. Next slide, please. Now, this slide is from the Wisconsin Hospital Association. These are screenshots from yesterday, and they show hospital and ICU trends since the beginning of the pandemic in Wisconsin on the left and in southeastern Wisconsin on the right. These graphs demonstrate the recent rapid increases of COVID-19 hospitalizations for Wisconsin and for southeastern Wisconsin, which, as I mentioned previously, are at all-time highs. They also show increased ICU utilization for COVID-19 patients at an all-time high for the state on the left and rapidly rising for southeastern Wisconsin. Now, I would point out that in Wisconsin, we're not alone in experiencing such a surge as currently there are rising hospitalizations and ICU utilization in 37 of our 50 U.S. states. Next slide, please. This slide shows that 78.7% of the patients diagnosed with COVID-19 in Wisconsin are categorized as recovered. Now, I do want to emphasize that means that they have cleared their virus and uh, does not mean that they have recuperated to their pre-COVID-19 state of health. Many of these patients are so-called long haulers who have symptoms weeks to months after their infection. We also have 20.3% of the cases that are diagnosed that are currently considered active, and that percentage is increasing as the numbers of daily cases continue to rise. 0.9% of patients diagnosed with COVID-19 have died in the state, and I think that's a testament to the high quality of care that we have here. Ultimately, when the pandemic is over, the infection fatality rate is likely to fall in at about 0.6 to 0.7 percent. That's five to ten times higher than the mortality rate for the uh, seasonal influenza. Now we've had 1,600 cumulative deaths in Wisconsin and 454 here in Milwaukee. The daily number of deaths clearly is rising in Wisconsin and Milwaukee, but this is much more apparent in the aggregate Wisconsin numbers. I'd also point out that these deaths disproportionately affect people and communities of color, but COVID-19 can be fatal for anyone. And as you can see that the majority of deaths in Wisconsin are among people who self-identify as white. And this is particularly important consideration in rural areas of the state. The doubling time for positive tests is trending unfavorably at 42.3 days in Wisconsin and 81.9 days in Milwaukee. The seven day growth rate of positive tests is stable at 1.9% in Wisconsin and 1.2% in Milwaukee. Now the reproductive number is 1.0 in Wisconsin and 0.95 in Milwaukee. Now these numbers had been at or over one most of the day since the beginning of September. But I'd point out that we need them to drop significantly below 1.0 before we see the case counts drop. And as you know, if we have a reproductive number of 1.0 and already have a high burden of disease, it means we've stabilized at an unacceptably high plateau. And I'd also like to caveat that the R numbers today may be inconsistent because of delays in reporting from DHS over the past weekend, which corresponded to their upgrading their system. Next slide, please. 
Now on this slide, I just wanna remind people of a framework for considering what you can do to minimize your risk for, um, for a COVID-19 infection. And these would include reducing the number of exposures you have to people. And remember, COVID-19 is most contagious in the two days before people develop symptoms, reducing the proximity of your interactions with other people, reducing the intensity of your exposure, meaning that you don't wanna be indoors or around people that are singing, shouting, or speaking loudly, reduce the duration or length of your exposures, uh, and these are all important concepts when you think about trying to reduce individual risk. If I could go to the next slide, I do want to talk about community risk and point out that community risk also affects your individual risk. So when you think about the community, the elements that add to the risk would include a higher population density, lower levels of population health, and these involve the social determinants of health, the number of interactions that we have in work settings, social settings, and family settings, pre-existing conditions in the population, and then the burden of COVID-19 in your region, which as we know is now high in Wisconsin. Next slide, please. This slide simply presents the concepts from the previous slide as an infographic. And again, community risk is based on five parameters, population density, population health, the number of interactions that people have in the population, pre-existing conditions in the population, and the overall burden of COVID-19 in your community at a given point in time. I think the most important takeaway from this slide and the previous slide is that the burden of disease and other community risk factors influence your individual risk. Next slide, please. Now this next slide summarizes individual predisposition factors for COVID-19 that increase your risk. Male gender, age over 60, obesity, race, and there's a higher risk if you're Black or African American, Native American, and some Asian uh, race identities. Also ethnicity, Hispanic and Latinx populations are more susceptible to COVID-19. High ACE levels, ACE is the receptor that the virus uses to invade mucosal cells, and non-type O blood as well as pre-existing conditions like kidney disease, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, cancer, lung disease, COPD, asthma, autoimmune disorders, and immune dysfunction like people would have if they're on chemotherapy for cancer. Also, there's a right, uh, growing awareness that low zinc and vitamin D levels might also be risk factors. So with this backdrop, I'd like to emphasize that the idea that we should simply sequester those at risk and allow everyone else to resume normal activities is not a simple nor an appropriate practical solution. If we decided to protect the elderly and those with pre-existing conditions, we need to protect half of the population and clearly that's not practical. All of us need to participate in doing what we can to modify the spread of COVID-19. Next slide, please. There are also social factors that influence susceptibility to COVID-19. And these disproportionately affect people in communities of color, and they include zip code, neighborhood, healthcare access and utilization, occupation, educational level income, wealth gaps, and housing. Next slide, please. I just want to highlight the data sources that we use at MCW to prepare these presentations. From time to time, we do use other data sources. And uh, before the webinar is over, I do want to pr uh, provide to you a link that talks a little bit more about the R value. It's a, it's a very nice and approachable paper that I thought might be useful to the audience. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Tim. Uh, thanks, Dr. Raymond. Um, uh, some really, um, go a good presentation and some really challenging information. So, you know, the, I've got a couple questions for you before we get to our panel. And the first one, I think, is just a um, continuation of the, um, challenge we have in the state, uh, and the first question really goes to the, go, lays out the question, look, if we have a statewide mask mandate and people are wearing masks, why are we continuing to see the spread? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And again, everyone has to understand, mask is not a biohazard right, uh, suit uh, or a biocontainment suit. You're simply trying to minimize your risk. So wearing a mask is one element of reducing that risk. Um, but I would um, counter the, the 
idea that everybody's wearing a mask. It's simply not true. You see many, many people out not wearing masks. Um, so let's start right there. Adherence probably isn't optimal. And there are people that are interacting, especially in cold weather inside homes, which we know right now is the major source of community spread. So it's, you know, fourfold, reduce um, the intensity, the duration, um, the number and the duration or the uh, proximity of your interactions with other people. So you have to do more than one thing. And I also point out something that's a pet peeve of mine. Many public health officials inappropriately say, wear a mask when you can't socially distance. That's wrong. It's wear a mask, especially when you can't socially distance. A six foot distance does not substitute for wearing a mask. The other question, and we've had this multiple times also, Dr. Raymond, that when the, when the deaths are reported, that most of the deaths are what, you know, a comorbidity or there's some other factor. So somehow the system's being gamed and we're reporting deaths of people that have other factors attributable to that than they do the COVID. First of all, I'd say most physicians have no interest in um, gaming the system. Uh, physicians, not health systems, fill out the death certificate. And typically you um, put down all the potential causes of death. And what I would say is it, it's really not fair to say that if someone died of a heart attack or a stroke when they had COVID-19, that it wasn't due to COVID-19. We know that COVID-19 increases the likelihood of blood clotting. So I'm gonna strongly refute those claims uh, most of the folks that have taken care of COVID-19 understand it's a devastating disease that is the proximate cause of death in most of the people that have COVID-19. And I'll also say it's a value statement to just basically shrug your shoulders and say they had pre-existing conditions, they were going to die anyway. I don't, I don't buy that. Um, should we all be tested on a regular basis? Um, let me start by saying yes. On the other hand, one of the things we are not doing well in Europe and the US is contact tracing. People aren't cooperating necessarily with contact tracing and our public health departments are overwhelmed sometimes, especially when you have a surge. I think what's different about how well Asia handled it compared to how we're doing in the Western world is really twofold, immediate early availability of testing um, and significantly better contact tracing. Uh, Dr. Raymond, does the hospital and ICU capacity include the field hospital at State Fair Park, or is it just in the standard hospitals? It's in the standard hospitals, but what I would point out is the um, alternate care facility is not really a hospital. It's more or less a step-down unit for people that are on their way to recuperation. They may need, may need a couple of days of supervised care, intravenous medications, or oxygen. But these are all folks whose trajectory would suggest they're going to be home within 20, 24 to 72 hours. Um, there's a question about whether or not a large number of the positive cases recently reported have been in correctional institutions, and shouldn't that be called out to get a better idea of community spread? Um, yeah, and I think that that's a, a, a fair comment. But we know since the beginning of the pandemic, somewhere between 35 and 45% of the cases typically occur either in, um, in nursing homes or in prisons, the congregate living situations, um, and that the, the rest of the burden, 55 to 65% of the patients are out in the community. And then the last question, we'll jump to our panel and then come back if we have time at the end. Um, and you've talked a little bit about this before, Dr. Raymond, but um, a number of people that get COVID and recover still have some lasting impacts. Can you talk a little bit about those um, and whether they're age dependent? Really good question. Um, I don't believe that the long hauler syndrome um, or long COVID is age dependent. Um, and that, that could just be bias of younger people being on social media talking about their own personal situations. But it gets back to what I said early on, just because you're uh, categorized as recovered doesn't necessarily mean that you've recuperated to your pre-COVID-19 infection state of health. And we're finding out more and more that people are having lingering side effects, even people that had relatively mild symptoms. And some of those are fairly debilitating, an inability to, 
to uh, think clearly, uh, no motivation to get out of bed, some, somewhat like chronic fatigue syndrome. Well, Dr. Raymond, again, thank you very much for the presentation and the Q&A, and I know you'll stick around with us. Um, and so let's uh, kind of migrate this discussion uh, of the impact of COVID on our community and really talk about the impact of COVID on our learning community. And again, grateful that uh, uh, Chancellor Mone and uh, President Lovell and President Martin can, uh, can join us. Um, and M Mark, we're gonna start with you. Um, and I know you've got a presentation kind of to walk through just to frame this, um, but clearly it's had an impact on, you know, the faculty, on the students on campus, and, and really starting to impact for all three of your institutions, how learning is delivered and the future of learning uh, uh, as we deal with some innovations that you're all engaged in uh, from COVID. So, Mark, I'm going to uh, start with you and just have you walk through this and frame this a little bit for us. Well, thank you, Tim. And I appreciate the opportunity to address the MMAC business audience. And, and also uh, what an honor it is to have Dr. Lovell and uh, Dr. Martin uh, on the panel today following uh, Dr. Raymond's excellent presentation. Uh, Dr. Raymond is such an authoritative resource for us, but it does set the stage. And let me mention um, that everything you've heard exacerbates um, what had already been happening in higher ed. And I think you'll hear some very similar themes from my higher ed colleagues today. If we can go to the first slide, please. What I'm gonna do is share with you two slides on the forces of higher ed, and then uh, talk about, so what does this mean? Um, this is uh, really the, the types of trends, the types of things that we've been seeing. Um, and as you can appreciate, higher education uh, is really a microcosm of a lot of the trends, a lot of the things that are happening in society. They're just concentrated on our campuses, civil and social unrest. Uh, each of us could tell you stories about the protests that have occurred on our campuses, outside of our homes. And uh, this is something that we have been uh, expecting and certainly it's arrived in 2020. Uh, political uh, issues, as you've seen, uh, whether it's uh, from executive orders or uh, challenges with different student visas, we've seen international student enrollments uh, challenged in, in significant ways. We've also seen state support uh, with ups and downs, and I could show you some documents that show the continued disinvestment that the state of Wisconsin has made in higher public higher education over the last decade. Um, the achievement gap persists, and I need to tell you, uh, you may not know that Wisconsin has the uh, highest achievement gap in high school for African-American versus white students. We're 50th out of 50, 50 states. We're 43rd um, for Hispanic versus uh, white students in terms of high school graduation. So we're near the bottom uh, there. This gap persists, unfortunately, into higher education. And I know we've got many questions today to explore on that. That means then completion rates, that is those students who actually enter and graduate uh, are challenged and then uh, support for growing numbers of disadvantaged students. We've seen the pandemic affect adversely our students of color and many of the non-traditional student populations because of the types of employment that they have, uh, because of surrounding uh, community health factors and so forth. College debt was already there. It's uh, not going to get any better. Uh, we have over $1.7 trillion in debt, second only to the mortgage uh, debt in this country. And of course, there are different views, both corporate, societal, as well as others, uh, in terms of the value of the college degree. Uh, we continue to find uh, the data that shows huge impact uh, over, over uh, time in terms of lifetime earnings, but also the prosperity that is afforded to communities where you have higher uh, education degrees. Employer needs are huge. We have experienced in the state of Wisconsin uh, over the last decade, the number one issue is to have the right talent, the right place at the right time. And finally, uh, demography is an important factor. Uh, we're running out of teenagers, I like to say. So if we can go to the next slide, I wanna zero in on the latest data. And they're actually, um, these are mighty small uh, in terms of print, uh, but just, just to, to highlight um, some of the key things that this leads to. This is the latest data in terms of a survey that was just completed. And at the top, you see the most pressing issues facing presidents due to COVID as recently as last month. And what you can see is the mental health impact on our students, which had already been acute. And today it's really uh, accelerating. Uh, of course, the long-term financial needs and um, uh, the mental health of faculty and staff. So those are some of the top drivers. And then in terms of actions that are either taken or may be taken, I don't think uh, Vicki or Mike would disagree if I were to say we are looking at or have enacted hiring freezes 
we have looked at furloughs and we are looking at layoffs and, and other factors. That's how serious uh, this is. Um, so those are some of the things. So what does this mean? Final slide, pull it all together. And what you've really got, um, I think, I think you, you're gonna hear a lot of themes today about these four major areas. The academic enterprise, bumpy, turbulent, to, to say the least. It was already that way. Um, President Lovell has always talked in a number of settings, private and public, about uh, the challenges and the, the, the economic model being broken. Uh, Dr. Martin would explain, and I think share the same view uh, with respect to the funding and, and, and these, these trends that we've talked about and how acute they are. Um, we've got the need for testing on our campuses. You cannot test enough uh, in terms of both the students and the non-residential population, as well as employees. Uh, certainly the potential for layoffs, permanent closure of some institutions as we have been seeing uh, throughout the country. The financial uh, uh, impacts are quite real. Um, we're looking at, at a minimum of uh, $25 million losses this fall, up to as much as 45 million. Uh, we don't have the resources to, to weather that type of, of change. The student experience, um, first and foremost, self, uh, safety, health, those are, are critical. Um, but as Dr. Raymond pointed out, um, it's just not a wise idea in the state of Wisconsin today to be bringing congregates back and to have high residential campus. So UWM, 46% of our um, uh, dorms are full. Uh, we're keeping it that way deliberately simply because it's risk mitigation. Um, we'd love to have it higher, but that's not in the, in the cards for next semester. Business models for higher ed, um, we've got to be agile. We've got to find new revenue sources. Uh, the challenge is going to be what's the right size for the demand, uh, for the needs that, that we have. Uh, but we need to find and create uh, even better partnerships, do the types of things that we have with uh, Marquette University, Northwestern Mutual, and UWM in terms of the uh, Data Science Institute, uh, the types of partnerships we've had for a long time with the Water Council and other, other areas. Those are going to be critical for our future. Finally, enrollments. I don't think there's any campus across the country that's not going to continue to struggle with enrollments. And I don't care if you're talking about the high end, uh, public or private, or uh, the regional and two year campuses. We're going to continue to have uh, increases in competition because of demography and uh, just the the uh, views, the debt, uh, cost of college. So those are uh, some of the major trends, uh, uh, Tim, as I see them. Yeah, very, very helpful, uh, Mark. I appreciate that. And I'm going to bring uh, both uh, Mike and Vicki into this discussion here um, and kind of Mike, start you and Vicki out with the question, kind of given um, the presentation uh, that we got from Mark, just an overview. Um, wh what's been the biggest impact um, to your students. Uh, I'll start with you, Mike, and then Vicki. What, what, as we've kind of started the school year and then you've run through uh, the impact of COVID, what do you see as the biggest impact from your students? Uh, I got to start that uh, uh, audio, Mike. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, well, first, I think Mark did a, a great job laying out uh, some of the challenges uh, that we face. And I think that, you know, the, the, one of the biggest challenges we have for our students is that the experience has completely been transformed for them. And, you know, it, it really started last March when we had to send everybody home. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, they weren't, you know, ready to, to, to go home and, and to go fully online. And even those that we'd be able to bring back to campus, the experience is much different. You know, for example, uh, college is a very social time, maybe the most social time of your life. And for example, at Marquette, you, you, you're not allowed to go into a residence hall that's not your own. You know, we can't, you know, we are really trying to isolate students from interacting in that social way, and particularly in, in bigger groups. And they've also had to, to learn, you know, how to take their courses in an online format, you know, like a UWM, you know, and MATC, you know, we have essentially half of our courses are now online for our students. And so even if they're on campus living in a residence hall, they're still taking at least half of their courses, you know, online. And that's a different learning modality. And it's also been, you know, challenging for, you know, our faculty and staff to be able to convert, you know, much more of our courses online. But we've, we've managed, we, we've done it. And what you're seeing, you know, in Mark's numbers, mental health of our students is a real critical issue. You know, it, it's their struggle. They feel isolated. Um, you know, they, 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 they many times, you know, feel like, uh, this isn't what they signed up for. And what we've seen, you know, I think what creates, Mark pointed out to this, one of the things we have both some long and short-term challenges as institutions. Uh, the first and most important one is across the country, 
uh, enrollments in higher education went down 16% this year. And that creates, as you can imagine, you know, with the pandemic and, you know, all the investments we've had to make, the de-desertifications of our residence halls, the, the, you know, getting, you know, ready with the classrooms and the cost of testing. And, you know, for us, if we play basketball without fans, it's just, it, the, the, the economics just mount for us, you know, as institution, but those will have long-term effects as well. That 16% decrease in, in, uh, in uh, freshmen this year, for example, at Marquette, that's a four year, you know, loss for us. And guess what? I believe next year, because the pandemic doesn't seem to be going away, we're also going to see a significantly another decrease next year because you know students are not choosing to, you know to go to institutions uh, that are traditional like Marquette's uh, for that experience because it's not what they usually signed up for. And so, uh, for students, you know, I think the biggest challenge they have is that this is not the experience they expected. And you know, we saw it with we weren't able to have a regular graduation for our seniors last year. I'm worried about the seniors this year, the things that they like to do and celebrate. And so, you know, they've had to adjust and it's been hard for them. Vicki, how about, how about you? What are you hearing from, from your students? And I know you've got some special uh, issues just with student connectivity. Right. So, well, thanks, first of all, Tim, for having me here, uh, as well as uh, with my esteemed colleagues, uh, Dr. Roney and Dr. Lovell and Dr. Raymond. Uh, Mark just set it up so beautifully uh, to really give us a full picture. And um, uh, Mike followed up with some of the same issues we're experiencing. But that digital divide for our students is real, and we get to see it um, every day. Um, I need to tell you that um, We've already distributed 1,300 Chromebooks to our students and hundreds of Wi-Fi hotspots uh, through our library. And we will continue to do that through this next semester and beyond. But when you notice that 54% uh, of our students are students of color and a large number of those come from low income families, uh, you can just imagine uh, the economic um, disproportion uh, for our students to be able to afford uh, the connectivity that they need. Uh, and we've opened up our, our labs so that students can come on campus as well. But it's it's a hardship with transportation and, and other um, issues around childcare and work. Um, that makes it learning a lot more difficult. And so that gets into the mental health issues that uh, Mark and Mike brought up earlier uh, that are impacting our students that that isolation, but the complexity and the uncertainty and the fear around uh, COVID, but also around uh, racial justice in our community and what's going on there. So, so they're really feeling the effects uh, of both at the same time. And as you saw from Dr. Raymond's uh, data, they're being affected uh, at a higher rate than than their counterparts. And so, um, when we look at that college experience. Um, for us, most of our students are around age 30. They, they tend to be working, uh, have families, and that creates a different kind of stress for them. And, and so um, trying to figure out how college fits in. And so many students have decided to take that gap year and we're trying to figure out what will that look like and how can they still think about their future and their career um, as they move forward, because that that gap year um, is going to cost them in lifetime earnings around ninety thousand dollars, and so we don't want them to um, to take that year without really thinking through what that career looks like. And we're working with Milwaukee to provide a different kind of experience with some credit associated with it that is transferable. But um, those those are the things and the challenges that that we're facing uh, right now uh, with our students. So I'm going to ask this of all three of you are all in the, you know, in the business ultimately of educating kids and preparing them for their futures. And if we look at other industries, in some cases, whether it's, you know, medicine or hospitality or others, that COVID has accelerated a change in a business model. Uh, sometimes, you know, in weeks, what, what, what might have taken years. And all three of you have talked about declining just numbers of teenagers, Mark, as you say, there are fewer 18 year olds coming in. What do you see as the biggest impact that COVID has had in accelerating your business models? And, and, and when you look at that, what do you see as a permanent change going forward? And, and maybe Mike, I'll start with you. Okay, yeah. Um, so what we, uh, what Mark had pointed down to about the demographics, uh, Nathan Graw had written a book uh, 
a little over a year ago, he published it and talked about the changing demographics, it, particularly in the Midwest and how there'd be between 15 to 20% less college age students in the year 2026. And so many of us were preparing to be smaller as institutions because we knew the students weren't gonna be there. Because I think about all three of our institutions uh, you know, on today, you know, we all draw primarily from the Midwest, you know, between Chicago and Minnesota and, and Wisconsin is primary where we get most of our students and Vicki almost probably entirely from, from Wisconsin. And so we, we, went, we had already started Lisa Marquette work streams about what Marquette would look like in the year 2026 and beyond. How can we become smaller and, you know, <clears throat> look at you know, what programs we would invest in and grow and what programs maybe, maybe want, we want to cut, scale back on. And what happened with the uh, COVID-19 and when the pandemic hit, you heard me just mention, you know, we had a 16% decrease in our freshman class. That's 350 students or so. Uh, and I don't think that number is going to be much better next year. And so if you think about it, we were preparing for 15, 20% decrease. Suddenly now it's upon us this year. And so we've had to go for planning for being ready for 2026 to planning for next year and trying to figure out how we can restructure the university in one year to deal with this demographic shift and decrease. And guess what? We're having to do this with all these extra costs on top of it. And so as Mark pointed out, you know, there's no easy answers to how we do this. They're all difficult decisions we're going to have to make. But I think all of us, you know, in one way or another, we have seven different work streams looking at ways that we are going to restructure the campus to get ready uh, for what we know is going to be um, a change in demographics, not in 2026, but is happening now. Vicki. Right, we're we're actually looking at the same sort of thing uh, because of our size. Uh, we are the largest uh, two-year college in the state, and we have uh, four campuses, other uh, sites that we work with, and community-based organizations. We have uh, additional two uh, learning sites, and so what we're looking at is our footprint and what is that going to look like, uh, especially if we attract younger students. So we're we're thinking about the high school student. And yes, there's fewer of them, but could they get that early college experience? And with MQ, I think we've really demonstrated working with MPS and UW-Milwaukee that, that we can introduce young people to the rigor and the understanding that they are prepared and ready uh, for college. And if they're not, we can help get them on that path to make sure that they're ready to really think about their careers a little bit differently. Uh, in terms of uh, working with adults, we're also thinking about more of going to work to earn a degree. And that um, we can, learning happens every day all the time and adults are very interested in learning new things. How can we take those experiences while they're at work or what they're interested in and convert that into badges as we're working with Hera right now um, and to think about what are those needs, critical thinking, but we're also looking at coding as a badge. Um, we're just trying to figure out what are the real needs and it's just in time learning. That's what people are interested in and it's like I need to learn this right now, especially in this COVID world, things are changing so rapidly. It's that learning to learn and how can I do that quickly? How can I take the what I've learned on my job? How can we work with um, those employers to do internships, a lot more internships, but also um, just getting folks that they already have employed for them, thinking about how do we move them up? How do we upskill that workforce and get them the kind of skills and training that they need to really help these businesses to grow and prosper as well. Uh, but really thinking about partnering more with businesses to figure out how we do that. We're also partnering with each other, although it's a very competitive environment. We're trying to figure out ways that, do I need to build something or do I need to start this new program? Can I figure out a way to partner in a, in a very different way that we haven't done before? So yeah, a lot of the things that Mike talked about of decreasing our footprint, plus our workers wanna work more remotely now as well. So it's, students are starting to figure out once they have the technology that this, this could be at least one one option for me um, if I have childcare issues, transportation issues, work issues, that I can still um, take advantage of learning. Now, Mark, let me pick up with you and uh, maybe pick up on Vicki's comment there and ask all three of you, and it may sound like an oxymoron as a question, but what's the most positive impact on your, on your business model and on what you've learned from COVID? 
Well, you know, I think many of the comments that we've heard are actually not all bad. And Tim, if I can contrast this with, with you know, going back to your earlier question, you know, as we look at the future, we're, we're you know, if, if we thought we were a regular business and when demand comes back next year, we'll get back to normal. There is no getting back to normal. We're not going back to what we had before. The trends that Mike and Vicki have just laid out, I think lay the groundwork for some mighty new planks and really new business models. And, and to be optimistic and hopeful, maybe a little naive uh, because this is grim. This is just incredibly challenging. There's no easy wins. There's no silver bullets, uh, but there's some things that are really important to recognize. Everybody's talked about online, but it's not just going online. You've got to go online better because if everybody moves online, then all of a sudden everything is accessible. So how do you create that experience that is closer, the chat rooms, the personalization that we miss in terms of what you'd normally get in person. Who is that most important for? Seniors in college are not as concerned about that. I have to tell you, who's come back to college? We have higher retention, higher increase for students coming back. We have nationally, as Mike pointed out, 16% reduction nationally. Some campuses are down like George Washington University, 24% down for freshmen. That's, I mean, that's staggering, but the retention factors because students want to get done. So for freshmen and for graduate students, smaller classes, you need to be really good at the personalization. But, but for these other audiences, we also have to go down the path that Vicki and Mike have talked about in terms of new models for being online. What do businesses want today? Maybe they don't have time and can't afford a four-year degree. So we need to look at how do we digital, digitize competencies? How do we break degrees down into the necessary components, give employers the skills that are needed right now? Employers from the surveys that we see nationally, 50% technology uh, challenged in terms of the, a lot of the employee bases as we move into an IoT, internet of things, or digitally connected worlds. Um, we need to have skills that can really bring people to the fore. Uh, I think the contraction dynamic, um, uh, less real estate, what's wrong with that? Uh, the problem is, you know, how do we, how do we shed that quickly enough to, to reduce costs? Safety and health, that's always a good thing. That's gonna be a permanent part of our future. And the final comment that I'll make that's probably the best thing is this has put an acute focus on student success. The Higher Education Regional Alliance has uh, three important goals. And Dr. Lovell and Dr. Martin join me on the board um, and we meet monthly and we have collaborated like you've never seen before around how can we innovate better? How can we have better transfer? How do we have more focus on student completion and how do we have stronger linkages with employers? So we're working with Todd McLeese to create an industry forum on exactly those types of issues in that third area. We uh, had a, a regional announcement last week. We have a national announcement tomorrow about the Moonshot Initiative. We want to completely eliminate the gaps for students of color compared to white students, complete elimination in five years. Those are good things. Those are the positives uh, that we're really excited about in this region. And I just can't say enough positives about um, Mike and Vicki's leadership in terms of such important institutions making a difference, especially as we work together. So uh, Mark and Mike, maybe a quick question for both of you that's uh, come up from one of our viewers, obviously a basketball fan. Uh, do, do either of you expect your teams to be playing uh, with fans in their respective arenas this fall? Mike? Okay, that first and then Marco, you know, um, so, you know, I'm part of the Big East Board of Directors and what the Big East has decided is that if the local municipalities allow fans, then we will have fans to the extent that they allow it. And we know that there are probably some schools in the Big East there in locations uh, that will likely be able to allow them to have some fans. Uh, there are other venues that will not. And it will be a, a city by city. So, you know, we are hopeful that, you know, we can get to a point uh, that we can have some fans in, in the stands. I do not expect any you know, it did have any high capacity, you know, in the five star form you know, for any of those games, but we're hopeful that some of the fans can actually be there. But again, this really, you know, depends on many of the things that Dr. Raymond, you know, described of what the trends are within the state and uh, within Milwaukee will depend on, you know, I believe what we ultimately will be able to have, but if we can, we will. I appreciate the question. There's really um, similarly two levels of that question. You know, I'm on the Horizon League board and we are having that discussion. Ask me next week in terms of what we will allow in terms of league play and, and how, how many fans we think is the right uh, number. The, the bigger challenge though is the local level. And um, I think 
we have, you perhaps saw in the newspaper over the weekend, Wisconsin Center District and the Panther Arena, uh, they're having big questions about whether they will allow any events. So, so we'd have to negotiate with uh, uh, Marty Brooks on, on that. So that's one set of discussions. Uh, meanwhile, we're looking at the Panther Arena um, and, and the Klatchy Center on campus for, for uh, you know, where we would have our games in a limited capacity. I suspect if we do have fans, it's going to be in a very, very uh, limited way, as we've seen with uh, some uh, recent NFL games and certainly some of the, the, the recent basketball games. Um, but hang on, uh, keep those season tickets uh, in mind. We're, we're uh, looking to, to have all the support for the young men and women on our basketball teams and other supports. It's, it's, uh, it's really important. Mickey, let me start you out with this question or a round of questioning for all three of you. T take me out five years from now and, and what does, how does MATC look different five years from now than it does today, in part because of the impact of COVID, in part because of, you know, the changing student demographics, but, but look ahead and what's the biggest change you think you'll see at MATC in five years? Oh, I think that we already have um, a lot of technology that's available, but I think what you're going to see is that more students might be off campus, but when students are on campus, it will be a much more um, college environment with a, with a lot of um, different activities happening. The look of the college will be different. We're working on that right now uh, to change our appearance. We're going to have more sports, which we just talked about, uh, more clubs, uh, more activities. You're going to just see a lot more uh, folks um, together on campus, learning together and so forth, which you're also, I think, going to see um, in, our, in our community is just um, a partnership. Like right now, we're, we have the Center for University Partnerships and studies. So what you're going to see is that uh, more four-year colleges and universities are going to be offering classes on campus or virtually. And so uh, we started with Lakeland. Uh, that will be available on all four campuses, but we're talking to all of our partners. And I think uh, we're, certainly conversations with Marquette and UWM have already started about having a presence on campus so that learning is seamless. Uh, we're going to see a lot more of our employers uh, maybe having a presence on campus because we want that to be seamless as well. I think what you're going to see is more seniors actually um, on our campus doing that early college model. And I think that's going to be a, a very different atmosphere on our campus. Um, so those are I just, I think, some of the things and it'll be a much smaller footprint. Yeah. Mike, how about you? Well, I think, um, you know, and Vicki, you you know, very similar to what you described for MATC. It's it's going to be different. I just want to first say that there are a couple things that won't change. And you know, the first is, you know, uh, we were ranked 18th this year in undergraduate teaching in U.S. Susan World Report. So that academic excellence, that that high touch that market provides, that's one of our differentiators. That won't change. And the fact that we're a Catholic Jesuit institution and focusing on a core curriculum and the humanities and liberal arts are two things that will not change. But what will change is that we'll have uh, some programs will, will grow in areas like maybe nursing health sciences, data and computer science, maybe biomedical engineering, but other areas are gonna shrink and we're gonna have programs merging or, or, or even being eliminated uh, because there just won't be demand in those areas you know, anymore. So, uh, we'll also see much, I think we'll see more online and particularly, you know, more focus like Mark described, maybe in professional or master's courses and, you know, you know, finding ways to reach uh, new audiences uh, with formal educa education. You know, we're going to find a way to decrease our, our physical footprint. You know, we've found that many people uh, can work from home uh, and don't need an office here at Marquette. Uh, if we have smaller, you know, student body, you know, it means with less residence halls, less need for classrooms, particularly if classrooms change to an online environment. And, you know, I think we're going to continue to focus on our mission of research and service to the community. Uh, but, you know, those things are going to have to be more focused and targeted where our investments make the biggest impact. So we'll be structured. So I think that, you know, ultimately, you know, we will be different. And uh, I am, as, as Mark pointed out, the one thing I'm very, very excited about is the fact that I speak to my colleagues in this region and actually college trust country more than I ever did before the pandemic. And I believe we have some great opportunities, you know, to really align and partner that really helps reduce the risk of our institutions, but also provides a better quality education uh, for the students that we serve. Good. 
Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Raymond to kind of join us here for the close um, as we um, talk about the impact on your institutions and, and students. You know, and clearly listening to all of you talk about a smaller footprint on campus, you all have such a big part of the community and just a physical footprint. So that's something to think through if you're actually going to have a smaller presence. But um, I, I think the experience I want to finish with with all of you uh, as, as kind of major educators here is such a big part of everybody's experience in the past has been that on-campus scenario, the interaction with your peers, the learning, um, and that seems to be disrupted. So I, I want you just to finish with a question here is the students come in and they have a different experience. What can, ex what can employers expect from the students that are gonna come out of your campuses uh, in the next couple of years? So I'll, I'll start with uh, Mark, Vicki, Dr. Raymond, and then finish with Mike. You know, I'll, I'll jump in. And, you know, the interesting thing to me is, is we have this model. And Tim, you just referred to it, you know, kind of the traditional model and the experience. Um, and that focuses historically on a lot of the 18 to 25 year olds. But um, I would say that, um, you know, the non-traditional student and what employers and what others can expect going forward is we're going to be reaching out to, uh, in Wisconsin, we estimate that there's uh, over 800,000 people who have some degrees, I'm sorry, some college education and they want to finish. So, so that's a, a, another population, individuals uh, in correction systems, individuals who are un, un or underemployed, uh, people left behind. We know that there's an awful lot of individuals. So employers, I think, are going to going to be able to have uh, more opportunities as we look at the increased reach of technology, as we get better at this, as it becomes more affordable, as we break it down into different types of components. That to me is, is something that's very positive. Um, I think that, that what you've been hearing a lot about, the focused partnerships, um, those uh, that are aligned with what employers needs uh, are, that's gonna be increasingly important. So I think employers can look forward to that as well. So those would be a couple of comments that I'd offer to start with. Thank you, Vicki. Right, I'd like to build on that because I, I think that's really the direction. Um, so maybe they won't be on campus, but I think what you're gonna do is feel our presence more in our community, in our region, and, and maybe even across our state and nation. And that uh, because of technology and the use of it, we can, we can really connect in a very different way. But we can also be out in our community in a different way as well. And, and I know for MATC, we are in over 30 uh, community-based organizations. And we're, we're talking about how can we make learning mobile and um, and I mean that literally we we actually have uh, outfitted one of our trucks uh, to be able to go out to uh, middle schools and high schools and and in our community to to demonstrate what um, what those skills that are needed by employers um, and so I think just getting interest in just exposing more young people and adults who may only have a very narrow focus in terms of the community uh, of work or in the world of work, I should say, uh, in their community is going to be, I think, very different and open that up. And so I think that we've already done that with our incarcerated. We've have figured out how to expand that through our Second Chance Pell grant. And we will continue to do more um, of that with folks already working. I think what employers can expect is they're going to see students who are more agile. Um, they are going to be more uh, adept at learning because they've had to. They've had to adapt very quickly um, to the new circumstances. And so what they're going to do is get, I think, employees who really understand um, how to use technology in a way that they didn't before and work with uh, their community partners in a way that they didn't. So they're going to be bringing just new skills and adapt, uh, adaption um, of the new technology to their employer. Thank you. Dr. Raymond. Yeah, I, I think Mark and Vicki made some great observations. Um, what I see for medical education is that it's actually going to be more accessible and more relevant to the, um, the next generation of healthcare providers. You know, we were able to pivot very quickly to remote learning, working, and clinical care environment. And that went really well, especially for our learners. I think our clinicians maybe struggled the most with getting used to that. Our patients in general, at least the younger generation, were fine with it. But uh, you know, we were actually able to um, admit our largest class ever this year uh, because we became comfortable with being able to provide medical education in the comfort of people's homes. So you know, I, I think um, this is actually a good thing and that we're gonna be a better institution because of the pandemic. Thank you. And Mike? 
I don't have a lot to add uh, that my colleagues didn't already bring up, but, but I will just say that I think the one thing that the more uh, remote online environment brings about, first of all, it lowers the cost ultimately for education, which makes us all more accessible. And I think we all recognize that the populations where we still can have more growth and a bigger impact are more, are more diverse populations. So I think that even though the experience may not be the, like the traditional one we have between 18 and 24 year olds today, as we think about what the future looks like, uh, we, we were producing a more diverse, diverse workforce you know, for Milwaukee to thrive. And I think you know, that's another positive that this change is gonna bring about, uh, even though it's a difficult time to go through. Well, we're just about at the finish here and I wanna thank you all again for sharing your time and your thoughts. Um, I have a feeling we just scratched the surface on this, uh, but I just want to acknowledge on, on behalf of the MMAC um, how proud we are to have leaders like you running your respective institutions, the incredible um, asset they are to Greater Milwaukee, not just to the employers, but our entire community. Um, and I look forward to having you back so we can talk about how we can all partner uh, with your institutions uh, to make sure that you continue to generate the kind of talent uh, that this community benefits from um, and really help us on our mission to become to remain globally competitive. So again, thank you all for your time. Uh, appreciate it very much uh, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Tim. Thanks, Tim.